today. Oh, there's Peter. Perfect. Hey, Peter. Hey, Jeff. Sorry, I don't have cases today. That's no. all right. All right, Howard, would you like to start? Okay. Make you the presenter. Do you already have control, maybe? Let's see. I don't think so. Try hit, again. Hit the, hit the screen button. Here, I'll give you control again. Okay. Try now. Okay. All right. Here is a case of a stabbing injury. And the bedside radiograph is not impressive. As I'll show you in a moment, there is a rib injury down there that corresponds to the passage of the knife that went from there to there in kind of that direction. So let's take a look at the CT. And as is often the case with rib trauma and particularly potential diaphragm injury, the coronal and sagittal can be really helpful. So here, down here is the injury. You can, and I'll bring it up, see how this is very consistent with a knife blade slicing through that rib. And then if we look very carefully, scroll back and forth and looking at the costal attachments of diaphragm, right here, right here is a small defect and a discontinuity right there. And they actually repaired that. So at surgery, there was indeed a small gap here where the knife went through that costal attachment, a little bit of fat herniated through that defect, and that was repaired straightforwardly there. So just a nice case of a traumatic injury to the peripheral diaphragm in that location. Nicely shown here, particularly on the coronal right there and it didn't involve the plural space no huh let's have a look at the just to remind myself let's have a look again no you scroll through that ah there's a little plural fluid actually so there is i forgot about that there's a little plural fluid there but no pneumo yes yeah okay so nice a little bit of blood there yep yeah it, it looks it looks as if some fat got from the peritoneum also out into the chest wall there. There's some fat oh, tracking that, uh, that Well, injury. here's the injury right there. Yeah, but that low, low attenuation stuff is fat. So it looks to me as if fat got into the chest wall from that, uh, or the abdominal wall from that, um, from the peritoneal fat there, right? Oh, like scooching through here. Yeah, right. Right. Okay. And between yeah. between the uh, the the ends of the ribs there, so it's around the yeah, sort of going in you know. here somewhere. Yeah, that's one way to lose weight. Yeah, so guy's lucky that that was the extent of his injury. Okay, so unusual things sometimes occur in close proximity to each other just as a matter of random chance. So last time, or perhaps the time before, I showed you a case of dislodgement of the right atrial appendage pacemaker lead in the context of surgery. And that lead ended up going down the IVC. So in this person, this being post-op and the left being pre-op, the right ventricular lead dislodged. You can see it migrated proximally. There's a loop of lead it goes into the suprahepatic IVC. So that's curious. 
I think it's maybe the first dislodgement of a right ventricular lead I've seen in the context of cardiac valvular surgery. And of course, they'll decide what needs to be done with that later, later on. But that was kind of a nice observation right there. Odd, odd occurrence. So two of these in about two weeks, one right ventricular, one right atrial. Okay, this is quite the chest radiograph. So let me try and make this up a bit and give you a feel for what we're looking at. So there is, let's call it abnormal lucency, if you like that word, or air in this basal hemithorax and it's kind of odd. There's an interface here between the air and mediastinum, here between the air and mediastinum. It certainly doesn't look like a pneumothorax, and it definitely looks like air. So this finding here is just a little bit of a clue as to what that might be, and that is there's a little bit of air in the esophageal lumen right here. So air in a mediastinal structure, rather large. And sure enough, let me show you, say, the coronal. And I'll make that. There's your structure there corresponding to that, except here it's got water in it. And then let's just take a look at the esophagus, distended fluid, up and down, air distension of it up here, fluid lower down, and air in the lower esophagus going into the stomach, and I'm not sure of the nature of the prior surgery here. I don't know if that's bariatric surgery. So here's a really nice image that corresponds very nicely with that which is, as you might have guessed already, you can see here, at least at this time, the patient being upright, there is a air fluid level in it. And here comes the barium down and down and then starts to fill that area there and fills that area. So a wide mouth diverticulum. So typically we call those paltrin diverticulum. I think this is the biggest one I've ever seen. Sometimes you get more than one at the same time. Presumably, this is the so-called pulsion diverticulum. The esophagus is a bit distended, but rather large. Yeah, it's the biggest one I've ever seen. That is impressive, right? Yeah. Yeah, they they uh, they took that out. Unfortunately, after surgery, she had problems with the leak. It's a big, it's a big space here. It's a big entry into that, and maybe that was difficult to close but she had a post-op leak, but a large esophageal diverticulum, solitary, but big. So that was that cystic thing. Okay, because we have time, I'll show you this, which is just anatomy. So this is a situation in which if you were a trauma patient with pneumothorax, but if you were going to teach some anatomy, this is a nice case to show in part the anatomy of the pulmonary ligament. So for example, right down here in particular, we actually see very nicely because there's pleural air both in front and behind, we can actually see the pulmonary ligament very nicely. So it divides that pleural space into an anterior portion and a posterior portion and because we have air on both sides, we can see the ligament very nicely right there. So just a nice, a nice case to teach about the inferior pulmonary ligament and to indicate how, for example, in order to deliver the lobe from the chest, you have to incise this thing and it keeps the lung there. I know David will like that one. That's a nice yes, indeed. And, you know, it really helps to show the pulmonary ligament is outside the lung. It's between the lung and the mediastinum. 
Yep. And that line that you see in the lung is not the pulmonary ligament. It's the intersubalobar septum. So there's often a line in the lung that sort of extends from where the pulmonary ligament yeah. attaches to the lung. It goes inward toward a, an inferior pulmonary vein. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, just a, a nice teaching case. Mm -hmm. This is um, a nice example. I'm going to put up another one alongside it that I would use to teach the effect of underexposure on digital radiography. So, of course, the finding here is substantial image noise, kind of salt and pepper graininess, quite literally quantum model, quantum noise. And you can appreciate the graininess, obviously, in the white areas of the chest, particularly. But this is the kind of case that I would use to teach about the effects of underexposure on digital radiography compared to this one, where we don't have that same phenomenon. So if trainees are watching the video, a very nice example of image noise, quantum model, too few photons are used to make the image, and the result is substantial graininess noise in the image. And this one up here. Yeah, and it can mimic, especially like on PAs, it can mimic like tiny little lung nodules. Yeah, it can make you think like there's something weird in the coasts or something. Yeah. Looks like that. The cluing part, of course, is to look at the soft tissues here and here, all the white areas, to appreciate the noise is everywhere. Right. In a substantial way. Yeah. Okay, this one, notice over here, my comments, cysts, cystic, cyst, oh, two, should be cystic, but look at that key word right there, exotic, okay, so that's in part for my amusement. So here's the story, this patient came to our hospital from another place and they sent some radiographs and CTs with her. And I'll show you more details in a moment. The only time that I found out about this case was post-op, and you'll see how that pans out. So apparently she had chest pain, pneumothorax, spontaneous, and pleural drain placement. So now the lung is pretty much expanded. But if you look here we have opacity here so we'll have to put a question mark what that might be but if you look in the upper portion of this lung we see almost no lung tissue so there is something very wrong with the lung here structurally and then a question mark about what the opacities down here might be so let's go to the ct that came with her and we'll go straight to the lung window Here is our very large cystic lesion containing tiny residual fragments of tissue within, but mostly empty. There's that pleural drain. This gives you a feel for how large this is and its relationship to the fissure, which is kind of interesting because it seems to go maybe on both sides of it. And then hard to know exactly what's going on in there. And maybe the opacities are some form of re-expansion. I'm not really sure. I don't think there was a history of aspiration. So I don't necessarily directly relate the pulmonary opacities and a bit of fluid here. Maybe the fluid is, but the opacities may not be directly related to that cystic space, which will blame for the spontaneous pneumothorax. Okay. So I came across this after surgery, after the surgeon said, well, we've got to take that out and did, and I'll show you some description of his surgery in a moment. But in the back of your mind, I think it's probably reasonable to say that usually when we see such a large cystic space with tissue fragments within, 
and it's an isolated region, of course, this would be large. The most likely explanation, one we think of, is CPAM, congenital pulmonary airway malformation. This could well be that, I suppose. But the most interesting thing about this case is the pathology that the pathologist saw in the lung delivered with the specimen. Okay, so let me fix that up. Okay, so they saw a patient presented with, let me just make this um, a little bit big here. Upon inspection between the superior segment, Ola appear to be arising from actually both sides and inside the fissure. Took down the attachments of the bulla. We got into the bulla itself, examined it from the inside. It's parenchymal disruption. Appeared to be a connection to the pulmonary parenchyma from both the left upper and the superior segment of the left lower lobe. Staples, took it out, submitted it for pathology. Okay. So let's go on here. Pretty already seen the diagnosis there, but let me just, um, here is a description of the gross specimen, left upper bleb, shaggy spongy portion of tissue, no discrete mass or lesion identified. And there you go. So there you see the diagnosis. Okay, let's take a look at the diagnosis that the pathologists who know about this or have heard about it know to look for. So let's go this way. Here are some images showing some collapsed lung. There's some big air spaces. And here we have tissue, proliferation of villus like broad papillary structures here. And I'm going to go on to give you a bigger image of that, like that. And sorry about that, let me try and fix what I did there. Okay, here's the mag. Okay, so villus like broad papillary structures as well as blood vessels like placenta. And let's go on. CD10 immunostain highlights these interstitial cells. And then the path, my pathology colleague basically also included, let me see if I can fix that up and make it go on. Where did I have that? Right here. This is the histology of a real placenta for reference. So basically, when the pathologist sees that, they recognize that as the description of what looks like um, villi and placental tissue. So let's go back. So this is that entity of placental transmogrification of lung, which is known to be associated with cystic spaces in the lung, big bulla. This kind of presentation is um, kind of classic. So here is transmogrification. Transform in a surprising or magical manner. Cucumbers were ultimately transmogrified into pickles. Okay, so someone decided to call this placental transmogrification of lung. I've kind of been waiting 38 years to see a case of this for real. And here we got it. Of course, you can make the diagnosis, but if you see if you see a uh, large cystic space in the lung and you think of CPAM, if you want to mention something else exotic <laughs> and try to hit the ball right out of the park, go for placental transmogrification of lung. Very cool. Very cool, isn't it? Very cool. Very cool case. Nice. I like the path. That really makes it fun. Yeah. I think it's the first I've ever seen. <laughs> It'd probably be the last anyway. Is that the first time for a pathologist also, Howard? Have they, have they had, um, I can't to... remember if this pathologist has seen one before, perhaps not. The surgeon said, when I got the path report, I said, what the heck's that? So 
you know, uh, we all got excited about this case. Yeah, and cool. yeah, exactly right. You know, I'll never have a chance again in my life to diagnose one of these. Very unlikely. It's just so uncommon. Yes, it's sir. not, it's complete enigma. Like, why does this pathology associated with the cystic space? And that's the classic presentation, actually. Clinical presentation is a large bullous like structure in lung that may be associated, may just be an incidental finding may be associated with the pneumothorax and then this pathology, which to a pathologist has seen this before, it's kind of, whoa, I know what this is. I've never seen it before, but I know what this is, kind of thing. All right, Jeff, you okay. started Kate. Cool. Good one, to, good one to end with. All right. I got some I can show. Let's see. All right, so I'll start with this one. So this is a, a young child and has some interesting anatomy. So first you'll notice um, there's a right aortic arch here with mirror image branching. And there's SVC, brachycephalic vein, and then here's the pulmonary artery. And you can see it's May or may not, it looks like it has some stenosis there. There's a little bit of motion, but I think it's convincing. There's a little bit of branch stenosis. So when we see that, first thing you'd think about is tetralogy of Fallot. And for that, we should see an overriding aorta. However, you can see the aorta here actually is coming directly off the right ventricle. And so the question is, when, where's the pulmonary artery coming off of? And the pulmonary artery is also coming off the right ventricle. And then there's a VSD right here, presumably. And um, so this is a nice example of an unrepaired double outlet right ventricle. So it's along the spectrum of, of, of tetralogy of Fallot where you have malalignment of the uh, truncus relative to the, the ventricles. And in this case, rather than overriding aorta, just everything comes off the right ventricle. And then there should be, um, I don't see the ductus in this case. You would expect maybe to be a patent ductus, but there's definitely some collateral vessels coming down here that seem to dive into those left PA. But they can get branch pulmonary artery stenosis, just like um, you can see with uh, pulmonary, um, with tetralogy of Fallot. So double outlet right ventricles. I think it's the first time I've seen one de novo. I've seen oh, paired yeah. ones, and sometimes they pick it up on echo. But I think um, a lot of places are doing more and more CT for congenital heart. Um, even just, you could, they're so fast. This is not gated, as you can see, but you can swaddle the babies and just scan as fast as possible. All right, this next case is kind of crazy. This is a, I want to say, 40-year-old something woman who, this is a, a vascular case. You can see, um, so we have a whole runoff here, but already there's an abnormal vessel. This is her um, branch left subclavian artery, and you can see it's got this weird contour to it. It's got these little outpouchings. And as I go down her systemic arteries in aorta, you're going to see there's all these funny little outpouchings. There's one here. There's a funny shape of the sort of the arch. And as we go further down, you'll see there's a little outpouching here, another one there, et cetera. And we get into the belly, we start seeing more and more of them. And we see them even coming off the branch visceral arteries. There's one of the superior mesenteric artery, right renal, left renal. A little funny stenosis of the aorta, and then more peripheral mesenteric um, heart aneurysms, iliac artery aneurysms. So sort of just diffuse systemic aneurysms, and I had never seen anything like this. So I I showed it to Seth and Travis over um, over the over you know, phones and showed it to one of our cardiovascular people and. I don't know what this is yet, but it's probably some genetic order, maybe along the spectrum of Loewy's Dietz or something uh, that's causing diffuse systemic aneurysms. Um, but I've never seen this many in a single individual. Here's the coronals just showing you the extent of some of these um, in the abdomen. I'll make it bigger here for the chest and the belly. So yeah, you can see all these just aneurysms here. So clearly there's something wrong with the connective tissue to do this. I think it's Ehlers Danlos type four. Could be. It's in that because spectrum of, yeah. The, the number of smaller branches that are involved. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So we, we had a patient about 10 years ago that bled out actually from a splenic artery aneurysm. 
Yikes. Didn't have as many aneurysms as this case. This is phenomenal. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. But yeah, I think you're, I mean, it's definitely something along that, in that spectrum. So, uh, you know, they're pursuing some sort of genetic testing. Hey, Jeff, I showed a case a few weeks ago, um, something similar, and it was hyperacidophilic um, syndrome. I can try really? to pull it up. Okay. Yeah, I think it was maybe about a month ago. I wow. can try to look up. Yeah, as far as I know, uh, it was one of my. Uh, I don't remember the exact. Uh, yeah, but I'll I'll try to pull it up. And yeah, that'd be it, that'd be uh, great. I'll have to the, add that to the list. All <laughs> right, uh, this is just a nice case of um, um, tuberculosis here, and you got the nice bronchiolitis in the right upper lobe, some bronchiectasis, bigger nodules. But what's cool about it is there's also a pleural problem here, and you can see there's. So endobronchial spread. So this is active TB sputum rip roaring positive. Um, but this patient also has a really nice empyema. You've got this dense pleural rind, and the, there were mycobacteria just all inside this um, pleural space as well. You see some stuck along trying to be rounded out electasis. And then you see this has been here for some time. There's hypertrophy, the extra pleural fat as well. But I don't think I've seen a case of TB empyema with active pulmonary disease, but I mean, the thought is, is it just seeds the pleural space. Sometimes the cavities will rupture in there, but this is non-cavitary TB. So this is primary TB that seeded both the lungs and the pleura. And I had not seen that before. I don't see a ton of TB, but this was a nice case. And there's that nice, like a real, you know, I'm not a fan of the split pleura sign because you see it with non-infectious causes, but this is a true pleural rind here with, with that infusion. What about lymphadenopathy, Jeff? Was there any lymphadenopathy uh, in this case? I remember. I don't. I don't think it was. No. You know, not impressive small, at all. No, not really. Which you typically see in kids. Um, well, I think that's because kids are the ones that get primary TB. I've, right. I've seen it in adults with primary TB. Right. I think it goes with primary rather than kids. It used to be in the old days that all adults had had TB, so all the primary was in kids, but that's no longer true. Yeah. You think she's developed some fibrothorax? Because look at the ribs are all pulled oh, together. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm for sure. I mean, and you can see the lung is stuck here too. See that? Yeah, that's a yeah. good point. There's yeah, there's definitely volume loss on the right, and uh, this you know this visceral this parietal pleura is probably just like adherent to the chest wall. But yeah, there's probably reduced. Um, even if the after treatment, I suspect even if this effusion resolves, it's just going to end up with a, a rind of pleural thickening. It may even calcify over time. Yeah, good point, Peter. That's 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 important. Yeah, so fibrothorax. All right. Um, this is a kind of an interesting case. So this patient is a chronic kidney patient who has a bunch of swelling, and you can see just has tons of varices, lots of subcutaneous edema. But what's kind of cool is look at the esophagus. So this is a late phase CT, and you can see all of these sort of what looks like enhancement of the mucosa, but it's actually in the wall of the esophagus. And it's rather, yeah. almost looks nodular, but these are, the further I go down, you can see some of these are more tubular. So these are all varices, but they're, you know, we usually see the ascending varices from like portal venous hypertension from down here. And you'll see down here, we don't really see them. So these are called descending varices and they're much, much less common. And, and it's, they're presumably just collateral pathways from all of these yep. stenoses. She's got an occlusion or a high-grade stenosis of her SVC, but the azagus mm -hmm. definitely fills it. So this is from previous hemodialysis catheters. You see there's some calcium or right in that region there. But these are just quite impressive um, collaterals. But I don't think I've seen descending. I remember reading about them years ago, but I never have seen them, especially on a CT. Yeah, I'm, never, I'm not sure I've ever diagnosed that on a CT. Um, the old in the old days, if they had a patient like this, they would show you a a barium swallow to diagnose varices, mm -hmm. and then you would see them in the upper esophagus. And then Benjamin Felson, I think, was the person that coined the term and showed these very nicely in his book, and he called them downhill varices, and he's got a really nice description. Yeah, of downhill versus uphill varices, we call them. But in the old days, we used to be given a uh, a barium swallow mm -hmm. to diagnose the varices in the upper esophagus, not the lower esophagus. Yeah, 
I guess they can be seen with SVC syndrome too, especially if it's long standing. But right, this was just a this was just yeah from just chronic uh, probably chronic venous stenosis or obstruction in the chest. But this is a sagittal thin thin slab nip, but you can see all of those varices. But if you go down down here, you don't see them. Yeah, very dramatic. Yeah, and I, apparently I'm trying to remember. I don't think they bleed as as often either. But I, I don't know. I could be wrong with that. And then this last case is kind of a cool case, and this is relevant to um, things that we've shown. So, you know, I think maybe it was, I think Howard and David have both shown examples of axillary approach um, intraortic balloon pumps. And we've started using these here, and you can see there it is. So they do a cut down and they put it in there, and then there's the, the marker there. So this patient um, had had a heart transplant. That was the reason. So this was just for post-surgical support. And um, when they took out the balloon pump, I guess they do it uh, under fluoroscopy. They noticed, um, let me run this here. You can see they do an injection. And you can see, I'll pause it when I get to it again. Right there, you can see there's this linear filling defect that sort of has multiple little planes. So this is a uh, classic appearance of a dissection. We don't see these kind of studies very often, but there's a dissection. So it's unclear if if the balloon pump caused it. I'm guessing it did um, or something during the manipulate, putting it in or removing it. But anyway, um, it is a complication of these. And then so we did a, um, a CT angio just to follow this up. And it was actually kind of cool because we we combined the upper extremity with the uh, with the PE protocol because they were worried about um, also worried about PE at the time, and we were able to do this as a single study, and uh, I'll show you so we can follow up the um, subclavian artery here. So we'll go up, and right there you can see there's an irregular luminal filling defect, and then we can follow the irregular filling defect there, and then out into the axillary artery, and then you can see why you had that double line there. There's that 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 tissue that flap there and there's just irregularity of the lumen um, and then as you go further out it normal into the arm it actually normalizes so we were able to evaluate for any distal embolism in the arm, hands which there were none i didn't i didn't say those images but uh, you can have reconstruct the arm at the same time meanwhile you get a full look at the chest this is just some uh, immediate post-op stuff here from the heart transplant uh, some gas in the pericardium there so uh, we've done now two of these. Um, this one was for this dissection, but uh, as they do more of these uh, uh, axillary approaches, uh, they're, they're asking to evaluate those vessels. But uh, it's more to show the dissection as a complication of one of these balloon pumps. And that's what, this is what they look like when they come from the axilla. So, uh, so the, uh, the, one of the problems with these axillary, and now I've seen that there was one case this week that was jugular, not jugular, but carotid approach which strikes me as kind of risky, uh -huh. but um, is that they they seem to have a hard time keeping the position constant. So I've seen these things pull way up into the subclavian artery, completely above the aorta, mm -hmm. this proximal marker here. And you definitely don't want that big balloon blowing up in a subclavian artery. It's too big. It's right. going to damage. And so it seems to be hard to control the position of these things. They seem to slide around easily. Yeah, I guess an arm is more likely to move than you know, the, the leg at the, at the pelvis yeah. and also bigger, smaller vessel. The other thing I wonder about is with this, this kind of tight curve here, it's probably more prone to shearing and, and just, you know, just more stress on the vessel wall than a nice straight aorta. But I definitely don't, I don't know. Someone designed these things, someone engineered them figuring and must have shown they were safe at some point. But yeah, this is the first complication I've seen from these, but I'm seeing more of them. And, um, and though I think ones you show have a second marker that's somewhere out here. I don't think we have that on this one. It's going to be farther down. You look down near the diaphragm or the upper abdomen. So it's 25 centimeters below that possible okay, so marker. Be below. So the, uh, yeah. Maybe off the radiograph. I think so. Yeah. I don't, yeah, because it's hard to know sometimes how far in these are. Yeah. So um, I think. Yeah. We I think they, they have published, I think, because I, I remember I recent, uh, a few years ago, I was checking this stuff. They have published that they have higher rates of um, dissections and complications okay. with the arm approach, but they they prefer it because of less chance of an infection than yeah. going through the 
Yeah, I guess especially in a train. And then the patient can also walk around more he's more mobile yeah. to walk. All right, I've got one more case. And honestly, I can't remember if I've shown this. I know I showed it to Travis when we were at the ACR, but um, uh, did I show the case of gastric lymphoma? I don't think mm, I did. No, I don't All right, think so. so good. I will show this case then. So this is a patient who presented, uh, don't tell me I don't have all the images. Well, I'll show this one. So it has a gastric lymphoma and had this pleural effusion. You can see the um, what I have of it. The stomach is very thick, but on the follow-up imaging, there was noted to be gas in the pleural space. Oh, it looks like I'm missing half my images here. Well, I'll, I'll never mind. I'll pull it. I'll re-pull it and um, show it next time. But uh, I'll just I'll stop there. Okay. All right. Um, so we will we'll end a little early today, and uh, I will talk to you all next week. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Take care. Cheers. Bye, everyone.